Today's webinar is taking place on May 2nd, 2017. At this time, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Dan Lias. Thank you and welcome, Dan. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you all uh, who are participating by webinar today on this uh, presentation dealing with trust. Uh, somewhat like Austin Powers, allow myself to introduce myself. My name is Dan Lias. I'm the Transactional Business Consultant for CT here in the Midwest region, uh, primarily stretching from Michigan down to Oklahoma, and I've been in this position for approximately eight years or so. So again, thank you for all attending for today. And, you know, and really what today is about is, is trust and, and being able to trust yourself with trust, for a lack of a better term. Uh, trusts are an increasingly uh, common component of UCC work in terms of our filing and then subsequently our searching. So CT thought, thought it was important that we try to put out a presentation here for the next hour or so to kind of discuss the three main topics around trusts, which is, as you see from today's agenda, the basics, uh, filing and searching. Uh, Certainly, the most important thing uh, with trust, just like it is with any UCC document, is making sure that you are filing uh, correctly, not only with the proper name, which is the significant trust, uh, with trust is the issue, but also in the proper location. And again, uh, before we get into that filing, we want to touch on the basics to kind of get that ground floor kind of established and then get into filing and then certainly talk about searching at the end. You know, the thing about searching is, is that if you filed properly and you filed in the, in the right location, searching kind of just flows naturally from that. So we'll be probably spending more of our time on the first two uh, parts of the agenda, which deals with the trust basics and also with filing. So why trusts and why Article 9, as you see from our next slide? Uh, we start with is why we create an entire presentation on trusts under Article 9, like why are we here? Uh, and as I already stated, I mean, the, the, one of the main reasons is that we just see more trust work out there. Uh, there's, there are more and more filings that are connected to that. But in addition to that, we also see with that number of increased in, in trust being filed, the questions have also increased and multiplied. Uh, trusts have been an issue for our UCC clients since actually prior to the amendments of 2010, but in 2010, uh, uh, you know, we had the changes in 2001 where we thought we made some pretty substantial changes in terms of, of trust filings. The changes in 2010, I think, certainly helped clarify them. But, you know, it, it was a shift, just like we saw in so many things in 2001 and, in, and then subsequently in 2010, we, we changed how we file and deal with trust, right? I mean, and, and so the, 20, the 2001 amendments changed the inquiry pertaining to trust from the identity of the debtor to the status of the collateral, right? And this is, some of this is going to sound somewhat similar to what we deal with when, with corporations. So the identity of the debtor, whether it's the trust, the trustee, the beneficiaries, all that was no longer as relevant after 2001 and then certainly 2010 with the changes. So we're back to what is very central to our UCC world, which is the debtor name required by our Article 9 is what's vital. That is what is very important, whether it's a corporation or a trust, the name of the debtor is, is essential for proper filing. And those 2010 amendments just reiterated that or maybe even spelled it out even more clearly, it is the importance of moving away from the identity of the debtor to the collateral and the name of the trust or, or what, whatever form that may be. Now again, I just want to make this clear though, it is always important to know still the identity of the debtor as that determines maybe the filing location. However, it is no longer a part of determining what debtor name is used under Article 9. So obviously just keep that distinction in, in place is that for the filing, that is one thing, the location is another. So, the, so just keep that, uh, keep that in mind. So that's why we're, why we're here. And like I said, let's start this journey down the road of, of trust and trust work. So why trust in Article 9? We now move to our trust basics. All right, our next slide. Let's take a look at what our trust basics. All right, Black's Law Dictionary has a definition of trust, and it's simply this. 
Uh, it is, we, this is a kind of a common definition, and you guys can certainly read it, but it is, to put it more simply, a trust is a creation of law in which one party, and that's the trustee, has legal ownership of any form of property that has been transferred to him, her, or it, the entity, by the person establishing the trust. The trust assets are invested and are managed for the benefit of one, of one or more beneficiaries. All right? That's really what a trust is. All right? There's a few main, obviously we'll be talking about the parties later on, but in a nutshell, that's what it is. Just like when we're dealing with a corporation is, is that it, it may be vast in size and scope, but the actual underpinnings of a corporation are quite simple uh, in terms of the articles of incorporation. The same is true with a trust. I mean, the, the basic underpinning of this and the, the intent of it is actually very simple. It's moving money uh, into, a, into, an, into an organization or entity, if you will, the trust, to help a beneficiary, and it's managed by someone called the trustee. I mean, it's pr pretty much it's that simple. It is, again, uh, we get sometimes lost in the, uh, the size of it or the number of trustees or the number of beneficiaries and all that, but, re but at the core, this stuff around trust, again, is actually fairly simple. Okay. All right, so here is our cast of characters when it comes to a trust. As I kind of already alluded to, we have a trustee, the grantor, the estate, and a beneficiary. And so these are, you know, if you want to say this is our Shakespearean tragedy, here, here's our characters, all right? The trustee, as we can see here, is that that's the party that has legal control over the trust. Uh, and again, that person can take many different forms. That can be a, an individual. It could be a company that is specifically designed to manage trusts. Uh, certainly, the, one of the things that we come into in the contact with, and I'm sure many of you out there come into contact with, the trust, uh, financial institutions and banks will actually have an entire division set up to manage trusts, and so that's normally where you see where you see somebody managing as a is a financial institution. Grantor, again, that's the person establishing the trust. That's again, that can be one person, that can be multiple people, but again, that's the person who's actually starting this starting us down this path. They're the people who are normally putting the assets into the trust. The estate, that is actually what is the property that is owned by the trust. That is the, the estate is what actually is being managed by the trustee. And last but not least is the beneficiary. And that's the, pe the person or people or entity that is actually receiving some type of benefit from the management of the, and the management and growth of the trust. Again, that can be someone as simple as as the grandchildren of someone who set this trust up, it could be a nonprofit such as like an animal rights group or, 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 or pet group. I mean, it can take any different form uh, in terms of the beneficiary. But again, they are the people who are receiving the rewards of the management of the trust. So here are your characters. And again, it, I can't stress enough, it, it really it is quite simple. Now, we... I understand there's a lot of complexities to it after the, after the fact, but at least the cast of characters and the intent are quite simple. All right? So why are, so in trusts we trust, how do they impact us? I mean, you know, like again, not to sound overly Seinfeldian, but why are we here? All right? What's the deal with trusts? All right? Well, here's how they impact us, and these are just a couple of facts that we, we found on, uh, out there in the, in the internet, I, I do not, I, be, I do believe that it's not fake news, so I think it's good to go. We, we got this from legitimate sources, but, uh, for example, Bank of America derives 21% of their revenue from trust or trust management. 21% for Bank of America. Uh, that equates to a round, and I thought this number was pretty impressive, $1 trillion. $1 trillion worth of assets are managed by Bank of America. That's a sizable amount of money. All right. A uh, couple other facts here, you know, just again, kind of showing the importance of it and why we're why we as as folks that are dealing in UCCs might be seeing that uh, an increase in that is take a look at the inheritance from a trust and non-trust. From a non-trust, sixty-nine thousand. From an, someone with a trust, two hundred eighty-five thousand. And you know, as we all know, when you start having larger and larger sums of money, and people are looking to invest. There, there's no question that that's going to come into contact with 
uh, our line of work, which is you, you've, you've revised Article 9, UCCs, 1s, 3s, and all that. All right? And in addition to that, look at the types of trusts that we have. I mean, I, I think that I find this incredibly interesting, just like we have with corporations and LLCs and LPs and, you know, fill in the blank of whatever new organ LPPs or whatever we have now. Look at the numbers and types of trusts we can have. Revocable, irrevocable, asset protection, charitable construction, special needs, spendthrift, tax bypass, tot, tot and trust. I mean, uh, I mean, back when I used to practice uh, law, which was many years ago, uh, you know, we really had this kind of a, a set group of, t of, of trust that you used. Now, just like we see with corporations and so forth, we are truly seeing a proliferation of different types of trust. And again, that in just increases the likelihood that we will be uh, dealing with them somehow in our UCC world. All right. So now that we kind of understand that this is a lot of money and that they're everywhere and that there's different types of them, we can kind of now go into another discussion of the infamous trust creation. All right. And again, like I said, the tr we've kind of already touched a little bit upon, upon it, but really how it starts in is, is that the grantor, he, and this is a, a term of art from trusts, is, is that they, he, she, it, will pour property into the trust. Okay? The grantor, it may have thousands of dollars, it may be millions of dollars, it could be whatever they want, it could be assets such as land or, or anything that they may describe, this, define, and they can pour it into that trust. All right? And he can create, he can create, as we said, a multiple different, several different types of trusts, but at the end of the day, it's a trust. Right? The grantor can then choose a trustee, right? And that trustee, again, can take any form. It can be a person, it can be an entity such as a financial institution, it can be a standalone company that manages trusts, but again, it can, it can be a multiple different uh, forms, but again, a trustee is the person who is managing the, the assets that the, the donor or the grantor poured into the trust, all right? And then the trustee has a lot of responsibilities, right? And they have, one of their primary responsibilities is to grow the trust, is to make sure that the, that the assets that were poured into that trust originally are going to at least maintain, but certainly try to grow and become more, become more numerous and larger. And so they have a lot of responsibilities connected to that, all right? Now, is a trustee doing this out of the goodness of his or her or its heart? No, they obviously are going to be collecting a fee for their services. So obviously this is for, for trustees, it is for profit. All right? But in addition to the trust responsibility, the trustee's responsibility to grow the trust, they also have a responsibility to the beneficiaries to make sure that the beneficiaries' needs are being met for the trust. And like in this example, if the, if the trust is set up for making sure that the grandchildren have money for college, that the trustees' responsibilities to make sure that uh, when that time comes for those children to, to go to college, that that trustee is making sure that those demands are met and those bills are being paid and things of that, anything that is connected to that. But again, that can be anything, uh, just to let you know, guys, that a trust is incredibly flexible. It can be set up for a number of different purposes. We're just using this one here as education because it's the most common one, out, one of the more common ones out there. But again, the, the trustees' responsibilities are, or to the beneficiaries can be incredibly variable. All right. So since we, since we do seem to be spending a lot of time, or at least uh, alluding to the fact that the trustee has certainly quite a bit of power here, obviously almost like Superman-like powers from looking at the picture down there, we want to take a look at just exactly what type of powers, or, or before we get to that, uh, type of power of trust, we want to take, kind of take a look at the four, and I apologize, I jumped ahead of myself. We want to uh, first take a look at trust creation. My apologies there, guys. Um, like our beloved uh, Uniform Commercial Code, there is actually a Uniform Trust Code. Okay? Uh, and so this is going to be the law that kind of underpins uh, the trust law. And again, you know, we were, we were commenting about this a little bit earlier. This is kind of one of those weird intersections in law where we have two uniform, uniform codes that are kind of not necessarily colliding. I think the word, a better word would be intersecting. So we have the Uniform Trust Code and the Uniform Commercial Code. Well, the Uniform, commercial, the uniform Trust Code, much like the UCC, was created in 2000. 
It's been revised approximately five or six times, depending on your point of view of revisions. Uh, presently, 31 states have adopted some form of the use of the UTC, and presently, uh, here in Illinois, where I'm sitting, uh, they are currently going through uh, the proposal of adopting the UTC. Now, I guess what's kind of interesting here is, is like, as we always joke, the Uniform Commercial Code is not necessarily uniform nor commercial. As we can see here, the, the UTC has not been adopted in every state. Not that that should necessarily impact your UCCs, mind you, but again, understand that if you are doing more work with that, with those trust documents in addition to the UCC, just please keep that in mind that you also have to determine what kind of trust law that you're working with and how that might impact your due diligence. All right. So now that we've gotten that taken care of, now we can take a look at the duties of the trustee. All right. And as we were saying earlier, is this, the duties of the trustee, they are multiple and varied, but I think a couple of words that come out, I think, that are both of a historical importance but also legal importance is good faith, tr obviously trust is a good one, confidence, candor, these are all great words, but I think one of the, the, the two that step, that, that step up to the plate the most is good faith and honesty. That's the trustee's responsibility. They have to have a good faith basis for their decisions, whether that, whether the type of investments or payments to the, ben to the, uh, to the beneficiaries, and they also have to be incredibly honest. They have a duty to disclose almost everything. There's trust reports that they have to, re to generate on a, on a very consistent basis, and they have to divulge pretty much everything that they did. And so uh, I think that those are two of the most important characteristics that you're looking at. And, of course, the big word here, and, of course, we can't underscore this enough, is the word fiduciary. I think that is the big under umbrella word here. They have a fiduciary responsibility. And with that term of fiduciary, you know right away for, from our workings uh, in, the, in the area of law that that is a heightened, a heightened position. You have a, your, your duties are at an elevated position than, as you were just from a standard average position. This isn't like just your duties as you would see under some general corporate agreements or what have you. In a trust, you have a fiduciary responsibility which carries with it that extra weight. You really have to mind your P's and Q's. You really have to make sure that you're doing everything that you need to do to advance that trust and, as I, as I also said, to be divulging the information. So, again, that responsibility, I think, is, is, is probably at the core of the trustee's responsibilities and obligations. And, again, fiduciary, I think, is, is a very good term. All right. Uh, we have, turning to next, we have characteristics of the trust. And as you can see here, we have empty trust, transfer of assets, authorization, and trust documents. Right? When, you, when you start a trust, it's just like anything, as we were saying, you had to pour in assets into a trust. A trust starts as an empty ve vessel. Consider it like when, you're, when you put flowers in a vase and you have to pour water into it. Okay, well, it's empty. You've got to put something into it. So all trusts start off empty. Right? That's just the, the way it is. All right? Uh, now, some legally, there are different times when a trust can be uh, uh, the assets can be put into it. But understand that all trusts start off as an, as empty, and they need to have assets moved into it. All right. Uh, now, they and it, for a trust, they're either going to be deemed funded or unfunded. But as I said, right now we're starting with the concept that it's an empty trust. All right. Uh, now. The, one of the questions that may or may not be asked down the road is, is that, well, can a trust stay a trust and not be funded? The answer is yes. There are always some exceptions to where a trust doesn't necessarily have to be funded right away and still be maintained as a trust. But understand the vast, vast majority of trusts, they start off truly empty but within a very, very short period of time, if not on the same day or same uh, cycle, uh, the assets get poured into it. Right? That, at that pouring in, of assets is called the transfer of assets. Again, that's where the grantor is now going to be placing uh, the property, the, the, the cash, the whatever it may be, into that into that trust, so that it is now going to be deemed funded. And then, just like we have with corporations, and also with UCCs, another word is popping up here, and I do want to kind of talk a little bit about this. 
and that is authorization. You know, we're, for a financial institution or any company that is handling a trust, before they, they take anything on or any obligations on, there has to be an authorization document, right? Think of it as akin to if you're going to be filing a UCC-1 or a UCC-3 and the million-dollar question, especially in light of the GM case, is like, who's a, do we have the authority to go forward with doing this? Where is that grant of authority, all right? The same here is applicable to a trust. A financial institution who's taking on the duties of a trustee or, like I said, any other person or entity, before they can do anything, they, there has to be that authorization that creates that responsibility and that duty. If you do not have those authorization documents, then clearly the trust cannot move forward legally. So, again, very similar to what we were talking about with our filings of UCCs. Uh, where is that authority? Is it vested? And who is it vested in? All right? And then last but not least, we have the organic, the trust document, which we, much like a corporation, uh, you're seeing as an, we deem it as an organic document. And as we're going to see moving forward, with the public organic record rule that we've had since 2011, that also plays out here with our trust and the importance of that trust document becomes very vital when it comes to your filings of the, on the UCC. So that's sort of where we are standing here in terms of the characteristics of the trust. And again, empty trust, you start, you transfer the money in, make sure you have that authorization. And last but not least, um, connected to that authorization is your trust documents, the actual underpinnings or creation of the trust. Which now leads us to polling question number one. And with that, I give it to my good friend Victor to take it away. Thank you, Dan. Um, we're up to our polling question here. In order to receive CLE credit, you need to answer the polling question. Please answer in the pop-up box that is appearing on your screen, not in the Q&A box. That would be very helpful. And the question is, polling question one, what is the recent value of Bank of America's trust portfolio? Dan had mentioned this earlier. Um, number one, seven, seven hundred fifty billion. Two, one trillion. Three, five hundred billion. Or four, three hundred fifty billion. And again, what is the recent value of Bank of America's trust portfolio? One, seven hundred fifty billion. One trillion. Five hundred billion. Or three hundred fifty billion. Let's come to the end of our poll here, and I'm going to send the results to you, Dan, and you'll see how many people were listening attentively. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Works for me. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah, uh, a, tr a trillion dollars, guys. It is, it, like I said, it's a sizable amount of money that Bank of America it has under its portfolio. And so, uh, and if you think about that, uh, just that number alone you can understand how many UCCs would, would most likely be connected to that kind of dollar amount. That's a trillion dollars. So I appreciate the, the fact that 78, almost 79% of you guys got that correct. So thank you so much. So now we will be moving on, and we're going to be talking about, as I, as I talked to you earlier, about filing. All right? And again, just like we are talking about with anything with UCCs, the importance of who is the debtor is in, essential for proper filing with, with trusts. All right? So when you're determining where to file against trust, you have to determine who the debtor is. And that just stands to reason. All right? And who is the debtor? Okay, we're looking at 9102A2028. The debtor means the following. For our purposes, we are focusing on Section A. Right? A person having an interest other than a security interest or other lien in the collateral, whether or not that person is an obligor. Right? Uh, debt, debtor means a person having an interest, as we indicated. This is all the guidance. This is it. That was provided by Article 9. That's, I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that there was some other great, app, great place to get a definition, but this is it. So we have to look outside of Article Nine, outside of Article Nine, to determine who holds the interest in the trust estate. And again, there are various options for this, and we will go through each one over the next few slides. Right. So, as we can see here, who is a debtor? Trust is the debtor and is a registered organization. Okay. 
Uh, it is a separate legal entity. It generally holds legal title, and you file in the location of the, of the trust. Certain trusts, such as Delaware Statutory Trusts, uh, also Massachusetts Business Trusts, are separate legal dis entities distinct from their settler or trustees and can generally hold legal title to the trust estate. So the property is actually owned by the trust, right? In those kind of cases, as we're seeing here, the debtor is the trust and may be a registered organization, thus the filing should be made in the trust location where it is registered and the location of the settler, trustee, or any other party is really quite irrelevant. This is truly like a standard corporate filing of a UCC type of scenario. So, and, uh, so again, the, 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 the settlor, trustee, or any other party is really irrelevant. The trust, the, the registered organization is what is important. Okay. Here is another example. What happens if the trustee is the debtor, right? Now there are certain trusts that are not considered to be separate legal entities. Not a lot of them, but there are a few of them. Uh, in those cases, the trustee generally holds legal title to the trust estate in a trust for the benefit of a designated beneficiary, right? In those cases, like we see here, the trustee is the debtor and the filing should be made at the trustee's location, right? The trustee can be a registered organization. Uh, you know, one of the examples that we always we see here in Chicago is the Wilmington Trust Company, or a non-registered organization, or an individual. Again, it can be whoever you want it to be. Right? Right. In this scenario, uh, you should file in the location of the trustee, and the general rules of Section 9307 apply uh, to the trustee, which is jurisdiction of organization for registered organizations, chief executive office or place of business if it's a non-registered organization, so like wherever they write the checks or wherever the, wherever the person is sitting, or if it's an individual, it's the principal place or residence of the individual. So if, for example, if I'm, if I'm a resident of Illinois, which I am, and I'm in, in this scenario, uh, you would file that in Illinois. Okay, if I'm a, but if it's a registered organization and I'm registered in, say, Delaware or my beloved home state of South Dakota, you'd file in South Dakota. So again, you, you start seeing that there are some similarities uh, to trust work that you do see in our general, what we would say our general corporate UCC filings. So hopefully what the intent of some of this is we're going to try to demystify some of the areas around trust work for you guys. All right. Next slide is another who is a debtor. What if the trust is a debtor and is not a registered organization, right? Certain trusts are not registered organizations, yet they may hold some legal title to trust, to trust the state or property. In those cases, the filing should be made at the trust location following the rules, again, of a non-registered organization. Uh, thus, if the trust has only one place of business, Trust is located in its place, that's where you would file. So if, if again, if it's a non-registered trust and it's here in Illinois, that's where you file. If the place, now if the trust has more one place of business, let's say they have multiple locations, the trust is located at that chief executive office. So wherever the president sits or wherever they cut the checks, that's where you would go. And again, we're citing to 9307B for that rule. And, you know, now that we've learned you know, how to determine who the debtor is. We've kind of gone through all that stuff. Now we have to determine what the debtor name is. So now we've identified the debtor. We know who the debtor is in all these scenarios. Now we have to figure out the debtor name. And again, just like it is with our standard UCC practice when it comes to corporations, that debtor name is so vital to making sure that your filing is proper. Right? Here we have the definition of the debtor under 9102, again, debtor means the following. Again, we're looking at that. And then uh, 503 sets forth the rules governing the use of the proper debtor name on financing statements when the trust is involved. And now we're going to go through a number of different scenarios in the next few slides. And I just want to make sure that you have the language of, this, of that section as part of the presentation. So just so you know, this is, this is our starting point. So the debtor name, and here we go. Uh, when the trust is a registered organization, 
determination of the debtor name is really quite easy. Right? Just like, again, we're looking at a corporation here. You use the exact legal name of the debtor found on the organic documents. So the documents creating the trust. Again, this, is, this should sound very similar to our corporate filings when we're using uh, a, a UCC connected to, say, Dan Inc. So again, and now if it's, if it's Dan's trust, same type of principles apply. The name should appear exactly, again, I can't stress that enough, as it is, was specified on the organic record of trust. Truly, guys, nothing more, nothing less. This is it. All right. This, think of this, guys, like when we have our, uh, our corporate UCC filings and someone would put Dan Lias, Inc. doing business as, you know, Dan's towing, all right? Just like that you can't do on a UCC because it's going to be deemed seriously misleading, the same is true when it comes to a trust document. You use the name as it exactly appears on that registered document. And if, and if, it's, and if it says Dan Lias Trust, that's the name you use. If it says Dan Lias Trust and, and number 44-789, you know, data, blah, blah, and that, is the tr and that, is an, that name is the name that's listed, then that's the name you use. Right? Uh, so therefore, do not in any way, shape, or form add any additional information. Because again, or, or one of the things that we see a lot of, someone will list Dan Lias Trust, and then it will list Bev Odom, trustee, all right, on that same filing. Well, once you did that, you created an entirely different UCC, uh, an entirely different name, and it's not, and, and then you're going to fall into the category of being deemed seriously misleading, all right? So if the debtor is a trust, which is now to back up here, uh, if the trust, if the debt, excuse me, I apologize, I'm going to sneeze here, guys, I apologize. Give me a sec. Okay. If the debtor is a trust which is not an organization or a trustee acting with respect to property held in trust, then the trust name, then if the trust is named in the organic documents, then you use the name indicated. If now no name is specified, right, so now the trust is just says trust. That's all it says, right? Then and only then would you use the settler's name with any other additional information sufficient to distinguish the debtor from a similar, from other similar named trusts and things of that nature. So again, if this trust document just says something like the trust, right, then and only then can you really dive into possibly using the settler's name or the grantor's name or things of that nature. Anything else, you do not do that, right? You use the name of the trust as it appears on the document. Now the vast vast, vast majority of trusts, especially modern day trusts, are named. So you shouldn't really run into this that frequently. But if you do run into that, just understand that only in, in that rare instance would you use the settler's name uh, on your filing of a UCC-1, right? Now, the, and one more point here, guys, before we leave this slide. Under no circumstance, and again, None. Should you name the trustee on your on your? Now we're talking about your UCC here, your box one A or one B here. So I want to make sure this is very clear. Under no circumstance should the financing statement name the trustee. Period. I don't. Again, getting back to what we've already touched a little bit about, like the doing business as, or as I already indicated, the the Bev Odom as trustee. Do not do this. I mean, I, it, it just bears repeating. We see it a lot uh, on our filings, and again, we can't stress enough under the changes in 2001 and in 2010, by listing that trustee in box 1A or 1B, you are truly putting your filing in jeopardy. Right? So now you can uh, uh, put the trustee's name somewhere else on the document if you feel it's important, but it cannot be in 1A or 1B. Right? Uh, and again, the only exception to this rule, and again, it is so limited, but there is that exception, is if the trust is unnamed and whose settler and trustee are one and the same, right? 
So in that situation where it's just the trust and the settlor also happens to be the trustee, then and only then can the trustee's name go in there. But understand that that is so, so rare. But again, there's all, you know, like we, as we know in the Uniform Commercial Code, there's all seems to be an exception somewhere. But again, we can't stress enough, guys, do not put the trustee's name on 1A or 1B. It just is not, again, you're going to seriously jeopardize your filing. All right. We're going to go to the next slide, which is the debtor's address. All right. And much like, again, with UCCs, there really isn't any sort of general or special rules regarding the address of the tr for the trust. We all kind of get the questions like, well, can a PO box be good for a filing? Can this be, you know, you know, what are the rules regarding the address? And again, much like any UCC uh, requirement, trusts are no different. There are no special rules. Okay, the proper address to use on a financing statement is the address to which correspondence, correspondence should be sent. That's it. All right. Uh, often filers will use the field as of a care of address, so whether the communication is addressed to the trust by name or to the name of the settlor, it should be sent to the person responsible for such communications. Right? Now, if you do choose to do that, that care of address, be aware of the limited size. Okay, again, we, we, this is becoming more and more prevalent, especially with our, with our electronic filings, of the addre address field. If included, care, if included, care of means the entire address doesn't fit, then the information should be referenced in a separate part of the record. You know, you can do that maybe in box 10 of the UCC or box 17 of the UCC1 addendum. But again, that's if you're doing that in care of filing. But again, I, I want to get back to the salient point here, which is the address of the debtor is very generic. It can just be wherever the communications needs to be sent. And just like any UCC, it doesn't have to be overly specific. All right. Indication of financing on the financing statement, which is our next slide. All right. So before 2010, as we some of us were around before that day, finance, you know, the amendments and form revisions, the required completing item seven this required completing item seventeen of the UCC addendum form. All right. Uh, now that's all changed. Uh, and now the revised form requires checking a box, which is, I think is item five, if memory serves me correctly, on the UCC financing statement. Therefore, guys, you no longer have to file a second page simply to indicate that there is a trust. You don't have to do that. You just have to check the box on five. Right? There is one area of concern, though, when it comes to checking the box on five, and that's the language that says, see UCC 1AD item 17 per instructions. Right, I'm sure some of you have probably come across this. All right, item 17 on the amendment form is a miscellaneous field. For I mean, we already kind of alluded to that earlier. All right, the field and corresponding instructions for that section contain no specific references to trusts or anything like that. So this isn't some sort of catch-all matter for trusts. So there aren't any special rules here. All right, the reference to addendum 17 that we're talking about, guys, was provided simply as guidance to whether a filer could provide the additional information required if the financing statement provides the name of the set lore. So again, we're getting back to that very rare exception. The filer, again, guys, is not, again, not required to use item 17 for this information. There's no duty, guys, to do it. Okay? Any additional information about the trust or the trustee or anything else that the filer wants to provide can go here, you know, in item 17, collateral field or on an attached exhibit. And you always remember, guys, that additional information must never go in the debtor name. Again, I, again, I know I sound like a parrot here. I apologize, but don't do that, all right? All right, so in order to better understand this, guys, uh, uh, what we're talking about here, we're gonna, we do have coming up 13 possible trust filing scenarios that we're going to be walking through. But I just kind of wanted to touch base with you here on this slide that you're seeing now. And again, you just check that box. That's all you have to do moving forward. You do not have to do anything in addition to that. Where the, the new forms, especially since 2011, are truly designed to be as efficient as possible. All right? So that's, you have to just, but again, one other thing that we probably, 
I didn't say here, and I apologize for not starting this off, if it is a trust, you do have to check that box. I mean, it's one of the things that sometimes people forget that they, that they well, you know, we can fix it. Well, I understand you could fix it, but uh, uh, if there's subsequent filings after that who are filed properly by checking the, the trust document, you are just like anywhere else, you're going to be uh, suffering from a priority issue. So it does have to be checked. If it is a trust, you have to check that box. You can't go to Section 17 and correct the unchecked box. Right, you do have to check that box. All right. And as we see here from this slide, this is where you check the box. Pretty straightforward. Pretty easy peasy. And again, this is designed to try to get away from having to indicate it somewhere else on the UCC document or some miscellaneous grab bag solution. They, this is designed to, again, make sure that it, it draws special attention to that this is a trust document and that a trust filing, and therefore it's going to be have slightly different requirements. All right. All right. So now we're going to get into all our different trust filing scenarios. All right. And we have a, we have a few of them. And so let's we'll start off with the first one, which some of these are pretty easy. Oh, but before we get into that, uh, let's talk a little bit about just some generic uh, standards here. Top jurisdictions for filing trusts. Yes, there, there's a list for everything. Based on both tax and legal reasons, here are the top four. All right? And it's not every day that I, my home state of South Dakota wins at anything, but by God, here we are. We're number one, followed by Delaware, Alaska, and Nevada. All right? Something else that impacts trust filings uh, in terms of their number and their scope is the tax-free accumulated trust income. And again, you, we have a list here of the states that do do that. And as you can see, South Dakota, again, is listed, Alaska, Florida, Nevada. And again, these, these are the states that are leading the nation in terms of your trust filings, not only your creation of trusts, but also your filing of UCCs in trusts. So that's why we have that slide here, just to kind of denote, guys, that uh, if you're seeing an uptick in trusts and you're wondering why you're in South Dakota and Delaware and Alaska and Nevada, this is the reason why. There's tax reasons and there's legal reasons in terms of their formation, their abilities to be uh, defended against uh, legal attacks and things of that of that kind. That's why we have why we have these states leading the pack. All right. So now we can kind of get into uh, our scenarios. All right. The first one: debtor is a trust and a registered organization, and the trust has a name. All right. So on your UCC one, and we're talking about you know your one, you know we're doing the, the filing here, name of trust and address of trust, and you file where the trust is registered. So this is pretty straightforward. This is just like in many situations, like a corporation. You just you, on one A, you name the name of the trust. It's on that registered document, and the address is again where the correspondence is sent. Again, fairly straightforward. If they were all this simple, we probably wouldn't be here. I guarantee you that. I, that's true. All right. The second scenario is debtor is a trust and organization isn't registered, but the trust again has a name. So this is the Dan Lias Trust or the or the you know uh, uh, Tom Lias Trust or whatever it may be. All right. And on your UCC one, you have the name of the trust, address of the box, address of trust, and again check number five to indicate that it is a trust. Again, we were getting back to that, that infamous box five, right? And you file where the trust is located, and that's going to be the place of business. And back to one of our prior slides, if more than one place of business, then the location of the chief executive office. And again, the best way of thinking of that, guys, is where are the checks cut, right? And if you can figure that out, that's where most likely is the physical address, and that's, where, that's the jurisdiction that you're going to be filing in. Trust scenario three, debtor is a trust and organization is not registered. The settlor is an individual. The trust is without a name. So it's just like the, the trust, right? On 1B, one of the few times you'll see this, the name of the settlor. Not, there's no sense there is no trust name. 1C is the address of the trust. Five, check the box, right? Again, file where the trust is located. And again, we come, keep coming back to that. But it's wherever that chief executive office is where they, where they cut the checks. 
And again, as you can see here, guys, there are a lot of common themes here, and that, and that commonality is truly purpose-driven to make sure that we are filing in the proper location and that, and that there is some uniformity when it comes to our trust filings, all right, which is something that has eluded us for a v many, many, many years. All right. And just to let you know, we actually do have real-life examples. Uh, these have, we have stumbled across these, a couple of these, and so we just wanted to share them with you. Uh, we won't bore you with all the details, but as you can see here, there's on the first one, one of the borrowers is the John Doe Revocable Living Trust. The trust is established under a declaration of trust. The trustee is, of the trust is a Mrs. John Doe. She, now, she is no longer legally competent. There's someone else uh, who's taking care of it, Johnny Doe. And so the question becomes, how do I name the debtor for purposes of the UCC filing statement for filing, you know, you know, where, what's the name? Now understand, you know, all of the, all these facts about Mrs. Doe, Mrs. Doe being comp, not competent and, and persons passed on and all, you know, at the end of the day here, guys, none of that's really relevant. You know what's relevant is the trust is named. And once that trust had a name, that's the name that you're going to be using on your UCC documents. I mean, uh, lots of times, you know, we can, the facts do control most of our lives here in the practice of law, and, but the most important fact here is, is that the trust was named. Now, that might be a different scenario if the trust had not been named, but in this case it was, so that really is the starting point, and in many cases the ending point. Uh, the next one below is of similar type. Title on the real property is held by Big City Land Title Company. There's a successor to that, but the trust has a name. You know, now it's just known as trust number 983. Now again, on your UCC, what is the name of the trust? If the trust is named, that's the name that you're going to be using on your UCC. And again, uh, that just demonstrates the power of that organic document. If it's been named, then that's the name that you use. Right? So just, and these are real life examples. These are things that we've seen uh, that come across our desks here in Chicago and, and in other parts of the country here at CT. All right. So we're now to our polling question number two. Victor, it's up to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. We're on to polling question number two for CLE credit. Please enter in the pop-up box that is coming up on your screen now, not in the Q&A box. And the question is, what are considered by some to be the top two states for trust formation? One, California, Delaware. Two, Minnesota, South Dakota. Three, South Dakota, Delaware. Or four, Mississippi, Delaware. Sort of a test in U.S. postal codes here. <laughs> um, and we have the question, once again, please answer in the pop-up box, not the Q&A box. Um, what are considered by some to be the top two states for trust formation? One, California, Delaware. Two, Minnesota, South Dakota. Three, South Dakota, Delaware. And four, Mississippi, Delaware. We come to the end of our polling questions. And again, it looks like we have a lot of close listeners here, Dan. This is uh, very nice. Great. Good. Yes, and you can see the results there. Way to go, guys! Yeah, we're almost to an A. When I, and now, where I went, now where I went to school, we rounded up. So that 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 counts for an A to me. But thank you very much again. Yep, South Dakota and Delaware uh, lead the nation. Uh, uh, two very different uh, uh, states for sure. But again, it's this is based on tax ramifications and also legal ramifications. So again, thank you guys for paying attention and, and no disrespect to Minnesota or, or Mississippi or even California, but for once, South Dakota wins. All right, so there we go. All right. So now we're moving on to uh, scenario number four. Debtor is a trust and organization is not registered. The settler is an organization. The trust is without a name. Again, we're back to Name of the settler on 1A, the address of the trust, check the box to indicate that it's a trust, right? So uh, as you can see, we're seeing just some variation. These are all slight nuances, but again, these are the questions that really do matter when it comes to filing your UCCs, right? Trust uh, scenario number five, the trustee is an individual and the trust has a name, all right? And again, the most important thing on this scenario, guys, is the trust is named, right? So on your 1A, you can use the name of the trust, 1C, the address of the trustee, and again, check that the box indicates as a trustee, right? 
and again, for the trustee is located, it's their principal residence. So in this example, if, if uh, 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 Randy Shea is the name of the trustee, and her address is somewhere uh, 1234 Main Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that's the address that you use. Uh, but again, on the name of the trust, you do not use Randy's name as the trust for 1A. You use the name of the trust. All right. Real life ex trust example two. All right. Just because we just because we love you guys, the debtor is a trust in its name and has two tr trustees. One filing debtor's mailing you know on filing debtor's mailing address is both co-trustees mailing addresses. They appear in the notices of the. A and R secured promissory notes. So here we have two trustees. Okay? Okay. Does a trustee have an address as any other entity would have? The answer is yes. Now in this scenario, because we have two trustees, what address is important? Okay, here's one of those rare examples where you may have to file two different locations if there hasn't been an address that, has, that is one way, shape, or another designated. All right, as the possible address. So again, what here's a scenario where, we, like we have with UCCs, when you have multiple secured parties, and, and we always add some confusions or some layers of uncertainty. Here's one of those examples where if, you know I know it seems like a great idea to have multiple trustees, and therefore you know, making sure that someone's looking out for things. But understand that with when you start getting into multiple trustees and you have multiple addresses that does lend itself to being forced to possibly covering uh, yourself by filing in multiple locations. And in this scenario, if there, wasn't any, if there wasn't a place where it was designated as a main address and you just have two co-trustees, you would most likely have to file in both locations, such as Colorado and Indiana. Okay. But again, this is something that popped up uh, actually when I was from an Indiana law firm that I was dealing with. All right. So scenario six. Debtor is a trustee. The trustee is a registered organization and the trust has a name. All right? Pretty simple. 1A, name of trust. 1C, address of trustee. Check the box. All right? File where the trustee is registered. Pretty straightforward. All right? Scenario seven. All right? Trustee is an organization not registered and the trust has a name. 1A, name of trust. 1C, address of trustee. Check number five. All right? File where the trustee is located, place of business. If more than one location, again, where they cut the checks. Scenario eight. Debtor is a trustee, the trustee is an individual, the settler is an individual, and the trust is without a name. It's almost like the horse without a name. When you start reading that, the old song. 1C, uh, uh, under UCC1, under 1B, name of settler. 1C, address of trustee. Five, check the box as trustee. And again, this is a very rare scenario, but it, you know, again, we want to make sure that we give them all to you. Okay? Trustees' principal residence would be the address to use. Scenario number nine, debtor is a trustee, the trustee is an individual, the settler, settlor is an organization, and the trust is without a name. On your UCC, 1A, name of settlor, 1C, address of trustee, check the box. Scenario 10, debtor is a trustee. The trustee is a registered organization. The settler is an organization. The trust is without a name. 1A, name of settlor. 1C, address of trustee. Check the box. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be having check the box all night in my dreams, I think, I'm saying this much. All right, scenario 11, debt lawyer, oh, excuse me, debtor is a trustee. The trustee is a registered organization. The settlor is an organization. The trust is without a name. So again, here's one of those examples where the trust is nameless. 1A, name of settlor. 1C, address of trustee. Again, check the box. 12, debtor is a trustee. The trustee is an organization. It is not registered. The settlor is an individual. The trust is without a name. 1B, name of settlor. 1C, address of trustee, again, five, check the box. Principal place of business, chief executive office, wherever they cut the check, that's the address that you use. Scenario 13, 
Desert is a trustee. The trustee is an organization that's not registered. The settlor is an organization. The trust is without a name. 1C, or excuse me, 1A, name of settlor. 1C, address of trustee. Again, check the box. And one last real life example, Delaware Statutory Trust that has a related fund series. The, trunk, the funds are not statutory entities, however, they hold assets. The fund assets are the collateral for the loan. And in reviewing this file, you discover that some UCCs show the name of the debtor as statutory trust acting on behalf of and for the account of its series, so forth and so forth and so forth. There exists some documents between bank firms that show this language. What is the proper name to use? What are the related fund series? Right? This has happened a few times, unfortunately, and we actually have a slide on this hypo three, some thoughts. You use, the you use the Delaware statutory trust name as the debtor. Even though the statutory trust may have other related funds in the series, these are not parties. This Again, this is not part of the name of the trust, thus it may not be wise to list them on your UCC. All right? Again, and if the documentation names not only the trust as a borrower, but also the individual related funds that are associated okay, as such, put those names down as additional debtors if you wish, and again, clarify that in the collateral statement. Right? And yes, this has happened a couple of times. which gives us to our final polling question, polling for question number three. Again, please answer in the pop-up um, window that just came up on your screen to, for the CLE answers here. You have to fill this in in order to get CLE credit. Please do not answer in the Q&A box. And the question is, if the trust has been named in the trust agreement, you may, one, use that name as the debtor name on your UCC filings. Two, only use that name in trust-related correspondence, but not as the debtor name on a UCC filing. Three, can interchange the trust name and the trustee's name as the debtor name on your, e on your UCC filing. And four, can only use the name on your UCC filing as the debtor name if the trust is registered. And again, Dan, we have a preponderance of uh, answers here on one of the choices, and it is one at 72%. There we go. All Very right. good. I'll take it. Yep. Again, the name of the debtor on your UCC fine. Think of it just much like a corporate document, or, or, or an LLC or an LLP. Once it's named, that's the name that you use. No ifs, ands, ors, or buts about it. You know, that's, that's kind of the starting point, and that's somewhat of the ending point on this. All right. So, again, thank you, guys. We will only touch, I know it's 1 o'clock, so I will be very, very quick on searching, guys. Again, searching, again, is the, the filing is where the heavy lifting is being done, just like it is in anything on UCC. So with filing, searches can include liens, you know, federal and tax. Again, you're treating it just like you would any other entity, whether it's a corporation, partnership, things of that nature. You can search for that, all right? And under Article 9 searches, again, making sure you use that debtor name, search where it's located, uh, an RA9 compliance search, use the exact name if you're going to go that specific, but obviously most folks when they're doing an RA9 search will do a broad-based search. But again, making sure you're using that debtor name as it exactly appears is always, always a good uh, starting point, whether you're doing a broad-based search or an RA9 compliance search. And always, just like we are with corporations, guys, it's always a good idea when you do your filings to make sure you do a search to reflect after you do after you get your filings on, up on the records to make sure that you're there the way you want to be. Again, if there, you may have done everything absolutely right, but the state may have keyed it in wrong or or, or put it in the wrong location um, in the filing in the filing queue. So always a good idea when you're doing your UCCs, whether it's you know, and trusts are no exception, please make sure that you at least consider doing a, a search to reflect on your trust filings. All right. So wrap up, guys. Trust basics, filings, and searching. I think that we've kind of touched upon them all. Uh, certainly, uh, again, this is we're trying to demystify a little bit of the trust world out there, and hopefully we were able to accomplish that in this hour. 
Uh, if you do have any questions, we will do our best to answer them. Uh, if you've left them uh, with Amanda and Victor and so forth, uh, we will get to them and we will answer them as, as best we possibly can. But as they like to say at the lounge in Las Vegas, you've been a lovely audience. Uh, try the veal, and I'll look forward to talking to you sometime down the road. So thank you very much.